So we are here with another rendition of the BNH virtual event space. I am your host, Derek Fosbender, and we are here today with a wonderful photographer. I'm so glad I got introduced to her work, Natasha Lee. Um, Natasha is going to be talking about consistency in aesthetics. Um, so basically, aside from the title, I'm going to give you my version of what it is, is, you know, when you're looking through someone's portfolio, you're looking through someone's Instagram feed and you're like, oh my God, why can't my work look like that? That's what I feel when I look at her work. And so I'm one of those people that really looks at other people's work and say, I need to change something. I need to do something. I need to have an actual look and aesthetic. Um, so Natasha, that's my unofficial intro. Um, huge fan of your work. Um, so we're going to be you. listening to you today talking about how to, to get that aesthetic and how to get that cohesiveness. So thank you for joining us. Thank you everybody for tuning in. As always, uh, if you are watching on Facebook, feel free to drop a question or comment in the comment section there. And for those of you joining us in Zoom, we do have the question and answer mm -hmm. panel up. So if you look at the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, you can ask a question through there and we'll make sure we get it relayed to Natasha on here. So Natasha, I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me and thank you anyone who's tuning in. I'm so grateful. Um, we can just jump right in. I awesome. will be talking about um, creating a body of work that reflects your creative voice. And just a little quick intro for anyone who is new to me. Um, my name is Natasha. I'm a travel food and lifestyle photographer. I'm based in LA. Um, I work with clean advertising and editorial. And I just, you know, some of the work that places that my work has been in, but I don't feel like I need to read them. So <laughs> we'll just move on. I just wanted to give you a quick intro of like, who is this person talking? And we'll just jump right into the why. So why is it important to kind of create a, you know, cohesive body of work? And for me, that's something I've been thinking about and, you know, working towards for the last couple of years. And one of the reasons I think it's important is because there are so many voices out there that when you have a clear point of view, um, you're a little bit more able to cut through um, the saturation. I mean, we have, there's a lot of creators, a lot of photographers, and you know, when you have um, your own point of view and a clear way of seeing the world, um, you're attracting the clients who, you know, understand you and get you and want what you do that only you can do. And it's also when everyone's voice is different, there's room for everybody on, you know, for different brands and different clients. So when your work is coming through loud and clear, you're attracting the clients that you know, align with your style, your aesthetic, and the projects that you get are going to be projects that you're the best person to do for that, you know, for all the reasons that above. Um, I was listening to a webinar with a fine artist speaking the other day, and she was like, you know, I basically want to get paid to be myself. And when you're building this body of work and it's cohesive and clear and reflects you, that's basically the end result we all want, right? To get hired to just be up. And a lot of times, you know, I'll get hired um, for stuff and they'll give me a mood board and there'll be a couple of my images, you know, they pull to my website or my Instagram and they'll put it on there. And one of the shoots last year, um, the client, the photo editor gave me mood board she's like I kind of want the vibe to be like this and when I looked at the mood board I was like oh my god almost everything she had pulled from my Instagram <laughs> like a couple of the images weren't even on my website yet I haven't even gotten to you know put them up but it made me feel like she trusted you know what I was going to do with the assignment and really didn't give me a whole lot of direction other than the story that was already written and this mood board of the vibe that she wanted so I think that was really ideal and I feel like that you know, will happen more and more the more that you reflect that in your portfolio or all of that. Natasha, how far how or how often do you go outside of what your your I guess you could say your your aesthetic is? Is it you know, do you feel that that's something like if you are constantly go out going outside of your aesthetic for jobs that you're diluting your body of work or do you if a job's not for you, do you just cut it off and say no? No, that's actually a really good question because I feel like aesthetic is like kind of external where, you know, having a look, I feel like 
it's more like having a point of view. I don't think, I hope that it's not making everything look the same because every job and every circumstance is going to be so different. You're never going to be shooting in the same lighting conditions. You're never going to be, you know, in the same conditions really twice for every job. So it's really how do you take that job and how do you take that genre of something and make it feel like yourself? And I think that's actually, I'm so glad you asked that. I think that's a really important distinction. And so like, you're not trying to make everything look the same. You're trying to make everything feel like it has your stamp on it. And I feel like a lot of the photographers that I admire, they can shoot, you know, a plate of food or like an interior or a person and it feels like them. So it's not really like limited to genre. I think it's limited to like kind of a feeling. If that makes any sense. No, it makes perfect um, sense. And, you know, you want to be able to shoot across genres and just make it feel like yourself. I'll shoot, you know, food on Singlet, um, stuff like that. But I think another thing I'll go through later is, like, um, being really specific about what you do put on your site. And even if you can do certain types of work, if you don't want to promote that, you know, you can send, like, a custom PDF or something like that to show you can do the work. Um, but maybe that's not necessary on your site because I shoot a lot of stuff. <laughs> but not everything makes it into my portfolio. So, okay, I'll move on. So when you're starting out, um, obviously you're trying to figure out your style and it takes time and years and a lot of repetition. So how do you figure out what you want to say? Um, I used to be an art director and I used to be, basically be constantly collecting imagery. I'm constantly making mood boards and you know, constantly collecting inspiration. You know, stuff out, I screenshot it. I think that's really, if you know, you're starting out, that's the first step. Um, just collect inspiration, figure out what you're drawn to, and it has to be like a gut reaction. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, it's like a split second thing. If you have to analyze it, you probably don't love it that much. Um, screenshot it, like grab it, and like you have, once you have a little collection, um, I think just start really analyzing it. Like, what is it about this image that, you know, made you feel something? You know, it could be the light, it could be the, the way someone uses color, it could be just like a feeling that you had when you looked at it, like, oh, this made me feel, you know, happy or nostalgic, or, or it could be just the subject matter, I'm really interested in shooting, like, this type of subject matter. And so you start kind of knowing what you're drawn to and why, and that's, you know, if you can build on that. But really kind of, yeah, do it from, like, a gut level. Like, if something, like, hits you, like, you know, screenshot it and start analyzing. Where do you draw your inspiration? Are you are you a Pinterest mood boarder or do you look through Instagram? I mean, I, I I'm more of like a print mood boarder. <laughs> yeah, 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 there we go. Analog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about the analog. Um, I think stuff gets so lost on Instagram, especially with the algorithm that I'm not necessarily seeing all the things I would love, you know, necessarily. So uh, sometimes Instagram, but a lot of times more like print or like books. Oh, yeah. Well, when we used to be able to go to museums. A refreshing answer. <laughs> and a lot of film, actually, um, movies. Um, okay, so once you kind of do that, then, you know, start making some mood boards. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to shoot for a while. Um, I, you know, at one point shot, like, I was trying everything. I shot, shot a couple of lookbooks. I thought I wanted to do, like, fashion editorial. I've shot a couple weddings, and... You know, my first kind of attempt at trying to be a freelance photographer, it didn't really go because I don't think I was clear in what I wanted to shoot. And then um, a couple years ago or several years ago, I was working with, you know, a consultant and she was like, oh, you know, you should make a mood board of what you want to shoot. But it can only have up to 10 images, no more than that. And I had like stacks of stuff. Like I was like making all these like different collages that I really like. And I was like, oh my God, how am I going to narrow it down to nine? Like, I like everything. <laughs> you know, so I actually took the exercise pretty seriously. Um, I called it down. I, you know, thought about it. And the nine that came out actually ended up being like a lot of mostly travel, like lifestyle sort of stuff. And doing that exercise, and you can literally go and do that today or tomorrow, um, it just created such clarity for me. And I was like, okay, so this is what I really want to focus on. It really took kind of, yeah, going through that process to arrive at that, even though it seems like, duh. Um, so I think doing that is really helpful. If 
you're trying to figure that out. And once you have that clarity, then you can really start kind of, you know, honing in on the path and how to actually get there and, you know, almost like reverse engineering that. So we had a, we had a question come in. If you could actually jump back two slides. Um, uh -huh. We had a question come in on this image in particular. So, so um, somebody wanted to, to know about your aesthetic. What do you feel your aesthetic is? And then uh, somebody asked, so this image in particular, what do you feel, you know, if you could just talk about your thought process behind this image, like what are you projecting? Is there a certain sense? I mean, I look at it and I get kind of like this, like calming, relaxing, you know, vibe to it. But is that something that, you know, can you talk a little bit about, I guess, the psychology behind what you put into creating yeah. an image? Um, for me, like some of the work, actually there's another exercise that is like more like a word audit that on your work. Um, and a couple of my works that I like are kind of imperfect, um, rustic, relaxed, um, like you feel like you're there. It's not too static. It's not too posed. So those are some of the words that I kind of keep going back to. I don't like something that feels too static or too perfect. Um, I like it to feel like it's in the moment. Um, and some of the other stuff I really like, it feels like more like caught in between moments. Um, and some of it actually is like literally I shoot it and the thing disappears. So like that fleeting sort of feeling. Um, so for this particular image, yeah, to me it's like kind of, it's not perfect. The pillows are a little floppy, like, you know, there's just like one magazine on the table, but you feel like you could be there. It's not like this perfect, like kind of catalogy image, to me at least. Um, and you feel like you could be there, you could feel the light coming through the window, but it does fall off because it's not like this like lit flash image. So that's my thought process, but it feels relaxing. So it sounds like a and lot of, all. yeah. It, it, so it's like this common theme that you're building of it's, you what you are comfortable with what you see what you feel what you're looking at which i think is important for people who are watching who are trying to develop their own voice and it's not you saying well you should feel this and you should do that if somebody's mood is you know they're trying to create a different vibe with their work then they should be looking in areas that explore that what they're trying to do or what they're trying to look for yeah and i think that it's important to kind of just also yeah focus on the feeling because I think it's so easy to get caught up in the technical and obviously that part is important too because you want to know how to be able to do the technical things that convey the feeling but the feeling is really kind of the most important thing because every situation like I said is going to be so different you're never going to like something the same way so like but how do you get that feeling as much as consistent across all of it definitely all right I'll let you jump back to where you were the I just wanted to... was there another one no no you you knocked oh. out both of them in there so the other <laughs> one was related to your aesthetic which I think we're going to as the presentation goes on we we got to look at your work you know we'll get more of a feel for what your aesthetic is and then you know we can address that later if we don't if I don't feel we have a good idea of what your aesthetic is we'll get you your opinion on you <laughs> okay um, so as you're, you know, building and shooting, just know that it's going to evolve. Um, I just put this here because this was like in my portfolio maybe a couple of years, like, I don't know, a couple years ago. And it's different. I think it still has the same feeling of like being relaxed. It's just a different like execution of the feeling. But I just put that there because I just, I think it's important to know that wherever you start, you're going to keep evolving and that it takes time and a lot of consistency, a lot of repetition. I mean, you know, it's kind of a grind. You shoot, you like sit through Lightroom for hours and hours, then you edit, put it up, and then you shoot some more stuff. And you're constantly doing that and cutting out and adding. And from there, I think you start finding the common ground between your images. And, you know, back to what you said earlier, like I don't not shoot stuff that I don't think fits my so, like, I'm always experimenting. And then the decision becomes whether or not I want to put it up, but I do it. Um, I think it's important to kind of experiment, push, push what you, you know, you can do. And, see what works. Um, so I'm always really open, yeah, to shooting stuff and then figuring out later, like, this is it. Like, do I want to, you know, include this? And it's always a well, learning experience. You, you just brought up something that's actually a question I had. And, you know, I think when people are trying to curate their portfolios in general, we, we talk a lot about, like, curating Instagram feeds and your portfolio. And what should you show people? What should you not show people? Is there any, like, just a quick piece of advice that you follow for curating? I do, and I actually am going to go into it later, but having ah, a second there you go. <laughs> All right, perfect. All right, we'll hold off then. 
<laughs> okay. Um, all right. So the next thing, which actually kind of ties back to what we were talking about earlier, is doing this like visual audit of your work. And I also did this exercise kind of when I around the time I did that mood board exercise. It's like, what do I want to convey in my work? And you know, the words like perfectly imperfect, rustic, kind of intimate, um, relaxing. Those kind of words came up, and also these words are you know may or may not evolve. They may evolve in different ways, but I think doing this exercise of words that you want to evoke, whether it's words that the mood board you created evokes or the words that you like. However you want to approach it, I think, it, you know, just try putting words to the imagery and then, you know, you look at the imagery, does it convey these words? And you kind of, you know, keep tweaking from there. But having the words, I think it's just kind of just in your subconscious and then, you know, you're not thinking about it as you're shooting those things come through. And like, that's what you're looking for, or, you know, how you're going to direct the subject and how you're going to light it and things like that. So, I mean, now we're kind of getting into execution and having a shot list for shooting, I think is really important. If I do something small, like a portrait, I'll have a little shot list. Like, I want to try this, I want to try that. And for me, having a shot list um, helps me clear my head. And when you're prepared and you kind of have this list of what you want to try, most of the time it may or may not happen. <laughs> and then you adapt on the fly. And somehow or other, for me, like if I'm prepared, I feel like I can still come out with stuff that feels like me and not like, you know, something totally out of my realm. Even if it's like, you know, a step out, but it's still within a certain kind of boundary. Not boundary, but vibe. Um, and then things to consider when you're kind of putting, to, putting together a shot list, um, whether it's for personal or on assignment, but it's nice to approach personal work kind of like assignment work. Um, if that's the market you're going after, you know, I think about where it's going to be used. If it's an assignment, like, does it need more spreads? Does it need more negative space? Do they need like, you know, if it's a interior, for like a newspaper, maybe they want more wide. You know, if it's like a advertising, like maybe everything has to be a little more polished. So just think about that and kind of work with obviously those outside parameters you know there's that intersection of like what the client wants what your vibe is and like that somewhere in the middle um think about how many shots you need to tell the story because i think that's how you know you build the story if you need a lot more if you only, if you only have like four like how are you going to tell the story um and then it's thinking about aspect ratio when you're shooting and you know try to have options and that way you have more options to like kind of call down from you know think about if it's like if they might have a possible cover, you may need to shoot more vertical options. You know, if like a certain thing has to be like on the, you know, on the opener, then you try more options horizontally for that particular person or dish. <clears throat> so like I said, you have your list, but then you have to be adaptable and flexible, and then you can kind of adjust accordingly and still get a story that feels consistent. Um, Along with the shot list, you know, like I said, I get a lot of inspiration from film. I'm thinking cinematically ties everything together too. Like if you're shooting a restaurant, you know, you do the wide, you do a portrait, or, any, or maybe not so much the portrait. Yeah, you can do a wide, wide, medium, close. Um, you do, you know, different angles, you do the wide, you show the medium, and you're really telling a story of how it feels like to be in the place, but you're also, all these different elements that make up the restaurant are going to tie in together to make a cohesive story, whether it's, you know, the materials or the light or textures, or, you know, as you're thinking, think about this like kind of ongoing thread that goes through the imagery. And how a crazy. lot of times when you're shooting, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, how crazy are you going with detail shots? Are you taking, are you one of the people that moves around to, you know, like those two glasses there, would you put them you in five different lot. positions? Okay. Yeah. So there's I a lot of, so you're, you're taking. Like, yeah. Okay. I think that's when I go into labor. You shoot, I, well, for, for me, I shoot a lot. And then I, you know, analyze it all later and edit it later. But in the moment, I'm like, I want to try this. I want to try that. I'm like, what if it looks like here? And yeah. Maybe some people get it, like, you know, only put it in one position, but I move it around. 
And how, and how much of your opinion goes into, you know, is this something that you're generally like, if you're working for brands and in the commercial side of things, are they shifting you in one direction? Or are they just basically, look, we hired you for your work and your style. You, you do your thing. I think with commercial, there's a lot more communication and the pre-production end of it. Like, you know, they present the brief and I present the treatment of how I, you know, my approach to that particular <clears throat> brief. And then there's like so much back and forth, like before you even get to the set, like we need this, this, and this, or I think it should be this angle. And you, you kind of talk through it all before so that when you get on set, it's literally more like, like we're going to do this. And then, I'll, you know, sometimes if there's time, there's room to you know, experiment a little bit. Um, but with commercial work, I think a lot of that happens in pre-pro where you're communicating these certain ideas and they either like yes or no it or oh, we'll try that. Um, whereas with editorial, that, it, then it's a little more free, but like, oh, go do your thing. And so I think, you know, it's important to be able to communicate, yeah, those certain ideas like beforehand, whether it's through treatment or however it is, or whether you're talking through a call or, you know. Does that, does that mentality then creep into your personal work? Like when you're shooting stuff that's more personal, are you still doing, putting that same effort into the pre-production of your shots? Or are you more go with the flow? I definitely think about it, but it's more like, oh, this is what I think I want to get and then go. Okay. So it's a bit of an in-between. It's not like so scripted, but it's definitely, I have a goal and not a goal, but a vibe. And, Sometimes it totally goes totally different. And I'm like, oh, this came out cool, cooler than I thought. Or I'm like, oh, this is like, a, <laughs> you know. Um, so this is one of my favorite things to do after shooting. Um, it's just going into Lightroom. And, you know, once I do my selects, I think about how they all flow together as a story. And I love kind of just picking different ones, putting them next to each other, and playing with how they play off next to each other. You know, what kind of story do they tell when you sequence it? Um, this definitely happens more in post than on shooting, because when you're shooting, you move in, moving so quickly and just trying to cover stuff, or there's like all these people around, or even if they're by yourself, you're trying to cover, I'm try always trying to cover as much as possible, like, you know, get the angles I want. So a lot of, for me, it's a lot of it's intuition while I'm shooting, after I do all the mood board stuff, but then, and Lightroom is when I get to play with, you know, the sequencing and the storytelling. And, you know, you think about what ties these images together. And then this, I like this particular sequence because to me, like the pops of black, um, you know, and the design of the hotel kind of come through, even in the little salt plates um, and the leaves. And it feels like moody, but tropical. Um, so, yeah, I think it's so much fun to play with sequence and pairing. and it's also once you have those a grouping of stuff that you like, then you can just use it. You can use it in like an email, you know, promo, or you can put it on like a PDF and send it out, or you can just put it on your Instagram. And it just shows, you know, a thoughtfulness of storytelling. And yeah, thinking about how you convey the feeling of being in a place. I, I always find it interesting to ask um, artists and creators in, a, in regards to cropping. You talked about earlier, like ratios, and you're talking about composition. Uh, is there certain, you know, we talk about going cinematic in like that 16 by 9 look. How much thought do oh, you Oh, I didn't mean cinematic, like 16 by 9, more like well, well, interesting shot, medium shot, close shot. Yeah, no. Well, when I hear, I hear cinematic, and I, I automatically, you talk about like wide. And when I think wide, I think like... 16 so, I think 16 by nine and I think about just visually. So we're talking about, you know, composition, creating a mood and people respond differently. Like some people shoot a lot of, you know, especially people who shot, you know, film like the old medium formats of square format. And I hate square format. And when Instagram first came out it was like, everyone was in square format. It drove me crazy. Um, how much, how much thought do you put into like, ratios like is that something that drives any of your aesthetic at all like what kind of ratio you're shooting in i mean the only ratio that i really think about is really whether something needs to be a horizontal or vertical um, i mean i shoot canon 5d so the four by six ratio is basically um, most of my stuff and i think i was talking about somebody at an event and they're like oh you know this is film and they're like wait no no it's not because of the ratio 
you know. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm not trying to like, it's not like I'm shooting film right now because <laughs> right now most of my work is digital. But the only ratios I really think about are more like just something needs to be vertical, something needs to be horizontal, just as far as like end use of. Okay. And if it's my own stuff, I'll just shoot either vertical or horizontal, depending on what I like. Okay. Okay. So light. This is, I think, something that just takes time. Um, I put these four images here because they're all different lighting sources. And um, one of the things that's like, I've always thought, you know, when I was starting out, I was like, how are you going to get a consistent look if every single situation is going to be so different and you probably are not going to have so much control over it, you know, you know, depending on whether it's editorial, if it's personal, or if there's like a budget to rent and a whole truck full of gear. So, I like my word, like natural is one of the words that I kind of always kind of gravitate back towards as something that feels natural and not like overly lit or, you know, super studio lit. That's just what I like, but not everything can, not every situation allows for that, for using natural light. So I like to mix different light sources. For me, it's more like I shot so much natural light that I know how the light is at every single time of the day, you know, when it's like, Blue in the morning or golden at night or the high, you know, noon look, which is like raw shadows or like that soft, like late afternoon look. And so like depending on the end, you know, result of what I want, then you kind of, you know, work it backwards that way. Um, I also really like continuous light and I use it when I can. Um, like <clears throat> I'll just go through these four. Um, this food is actually continuous light. It was like an editorial shoot, like super like fun and gun, but I brought some lights with me and um, I wanted to light this just because you know it's a dark table the saute is dark you know the meat is dark looking so it kind of kicks in a couple of little highlights where the peanuts and the meat are but it's not like it doesn't feel like to me it doesn't feel like studio lit so there I use continuous light to just pick up some highlights and separate the meat um, and this interior shot was actually like pretty much natural light um, we shot late afternoon and this house and only had a couple hours because that's how editorial shoots go and you know I just saw, saw the light coming through we closed the windows to you know ask them to close the windows to get that beautiful pattern because that's like source and somewhere amazing um so that's natural light and I knew that I wanted it kind of warm because the vibe of the house is warm it's like mid-century it has like a lot of more like golden tones like the blanket and the ground and the green so the warm light really went with it and you know, I added a little bit of, I pulled down a little highlights and post, but I didn't do a whole lot of forest color. Like, that's just what it was. But, you know, if you do want that look and, you know, you have to shoot, like, in the morning or something, so how are you going to, you know, you just reverse, kind of reverse engineer that. Like, oh, I, you know, need to get a light source that's, like, wide and a little lower and maybe gel it to get the warmer look. So you just kind of think about that and just, you know, see, figure out what you need from there. Um, like if you want the high noon look and, you know, you're shooting something, then you might have to, you know, factor in getting like a boom arm that goes like super high to get that like super high light and get that hard contrast. And so you kind of use like your end result to figure out like what you need and, you know, work it around the logistics that are possible. Um, and so the pasta shot was strobe. I just wanted to feel like kind of aspect window light coming through as he's making the pasta, but where he's making it was actually not near a window, so he strobe kind of just hit that with a little bit of light. And just like this was this whole setup was like there was a lot of movement. Like he's like moving and falling in, so like you know, and I had a system on this one because it's a commercial shoot, so basically it would just be like, oh, back it off. It's too too sorty, you know, move here, move there. So you you just kind of I'll see what I, you know, I'll see the result and be like, mm, I don't like this, let's move this. So you're basically just tweaking and moving once you know what you want to come out with. Do you ever and the shoot... portrait is basically window light, go ahead. Do you ever shoot tethered or no? I do shoot tethered, yeah. Okay. This okay. particular setup was not tethered because it was like a small room, but the rest of the stuff on that particular shoot was tethered. Okay. Um, yeah, on commercial shoots, I do shoot tethered, you know, with the digital and all of that um and then yeah the portrait like i said was window light 
So yeah, just mixing light sources and knowing what you want to get and you can kind of just work that way. Or that's how I like to do it. So this is like one of my favorite mantras and it goes kind of, we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier where like I do shoot everything and a lot of things, but you know, I'm constantly calling it down and you know, I'll shoot like, you know, on a travel shoot, what you'll get like a couple thousand photos for somewhere over a couple of days, whether it's personal or editorial, but really you're only going to show like 20 to 30 maybe. So, you, you know, just really editing down, editing down and always analyzing like this is, you know, evoke the feeling, this, this, how does, how do I feel about this? This is an image I'm proud of. Um, so shoot, shoot, shoot a lot. Editing, editing your own work is really important. Um, like, look, I, I mean, I look at every single frame I shot, <laughs> which is really time consuming sometimes. But um, if you're kind of starting out, I think that's one of the fastest way to get better. Um, I know that I've met some people who are like, oh, they just want to shoot and hand off, you know, the work to somebody else to kind of go through and edit. But if you don't know what you've shot, you don't know, you know, what worked, what didn't, what you could have done better, or, you know, what kind of vibe you have. So looking through every single frame, I think is really important. And for me, that's like, I have shoots, or, you know, where I come back, and I'm like, so mad at myself for like days. I'm like, why didn't I try like this? Why didn't I get that? You know, and when you edit every frame or like you just look through everything you got and just get a sense of what you shot, what you tried, what you didn't try, and you get this like mental library. You know, the more you shoot, like, oh, I thought this light was really cool this way, or oh, I like when I move the fork this way, or oh, when this person did this, it was pretty cool. Um, and when you, you know, look through all your work, then you kind of are able to make these like split second decisions um, on the shoot day of like what you like and what you don't and what you want to try. Um, and then something interesting that I learned um, from just looking at all my stuff is on travel, you know, like I'll do a frame of something and I'll do a couple alts just to get a couple different angles. And I've noticed that for me personally, like, I'm like, oh, I always like the first one. And so it was just an interesting observation. Um, just from like, I always end up liking the first one the most, where it's like, I don't even think about it. I just shot it. And then like, when I think about it, I'm like, oh, I'll try from this, this, and this angle. And those don't feel as, you know, organic to me. And so knowing that just from seeing all the stuff, I'm like, feel a little more like if I don't get the time for the all, so if I have to move on, then I think I'm okay. So just like learning from what you've done. Um, and yeah, you drive yourself crazy, <laughs> but it's a really good way of moving forward and learning as a storyteller. You know, I think as creators, we like images for certain reasons, right? Like while we're shooting, like maybe, you know, you just really like that moment or maybe like it just reminds you of a song, like who knows? But when you're editing, a, I mean, especially if you're trying to go after commercial or editorial work, um, you just want that to be kind of a solid edit. And I just think having a second opinion is really helpful. So someone who's basically can tell me or is not afraid to say, like, I think we should take this image out. It just adds a little bit of objectivity when you're trying to call your work together. You know, maybe something stands out that didn't stand out to you. And obviously, like, you're going to have the final, like, you know, you know whatever. You're, you're going to ultimately decide what you want to put up. But someone having that opinion and, you know, sharing their thoughts. Is really helpful. And you know, someone who understands your voice. It could be a friend, it could be another photographer if you guys agree to, you know, be truthful. Um, it could be like um, a consultant or whoever. It could be any, like, you know, it could be someone like an art director you collaborate with. Um, but ideally, it's someone who knows um, the market you're trying to reach to is really helpful. They can get a sense of what images, you know, speak stronger to clients than others. So, I don't do this all the time, but once in a while, I do get a second opinion on editing if I'm trying to do more of like a overhaul. Or so we can jump into some like post-production color stuff, which is one of my favorite things. Um, I have this image as like an, just as an, as an example, as an outtake from a shoot. Um, 
so the raw is pretty, you know, like, it's fine, it's like a little flatter, but the final image is not that different from the raw. Um, so the first thing I do is take it into Lightroom. Um, I do, there are certain presets that I like, but they don't work for everything. I personally kind of like the VSCO portrait presets, but I don't think they make those anymore, but there's so many other presets that emulate film. So that happens to be what I, I like to use. And, but I also think that they also don't work well with dark tones. Like if you're shooting wood, if there's a lot of wood in the frame, or if there's like a darker skin tone or a lot of shadows, it gets really muddy. So I think being aware of where your presets don't work, you know, the boundaries that they have is important because you're not going to be able to ever do one setting for everything. You're always going to have to manually adjust and things like that. So I think that's important to kind of keep in mind. So I'll do the, you know, this particular one I did, the preset did kind of like was a good starting off point. And then I, you know, do all my slider adjustments. Lots of times I'll do the preset and I'll actually try to like bring down the intensity of the preset through the sliders. Because I just wanted like a subtle hit, not like so in your face, you know, I put a filter on it. So I'll almost kind of like de-adjust it from the filters, whether it's like through saturation or like I'll take down the contrast. And I really like all the HSL settings on Lightroom, especially being able to isolate the colors. I use that a lot when I want to tweak the blues. You know, I I took a lot of photo, I don't, I wasn't a photo major, but I took a lot of photo electives and I had access to the dark room and I used to print, you know, print a lot of color prints. And when you're like adjusting magentas, like by the point on like a color print, you start getting to know like, oh, this is a little too red or oh, this is a little too blue. And you can obviously do that in Photoshop and just like, you start like dialing down the type of color tones that speak to you. Um, so play, just, you know, just play around with that. And a lot of times, I'll, yeah, I'll just tweak like the sky blue. I don't, I think it's too cyan, it looks too fake. So I'll like bring in a little warmth, um, things like that. And it's really just like, you know, it's like cooking. You know, if you like a little more salt, you have a little more salt. If you don't, then it's because everything is kind of to taste and how you react to it. Um, okay. So then I'll just bring in my Photoshop file. So I think you asked, do I use Photoshop? And for the images that I like that I want to kind of edit, I'll export it out of Lightroom and do just a couple little like final tweaks in Photoshop. So this is the image in Photoshop. Um, I'll just start from, it's super subtle adjustments, like I said, but to me, it's clarifies what I'm trying to say with the image. And I'm just basically eliminating these like distractions. Um, I cleaned up a little bit. You know, I just want this image to be about like the texture and the color and kind of like the graphic composition. All right, so I you know, just cleaned up some of the, like, I don't know, this pan thing to me was unnecessary, so I just took it out. Um, I cleaned up like some of the, this to me like was just jumping out because it's so light. And probably a couple of years ago, I would have been like, explore out Lightroom, it would be fine. But I just started seeing more, more details, the more I work. Um, so I clean up the horse a little bit, super subtle. And then this was probably the most dramatic adjustment I make, uh, made on this one. I use a lot of layer math and like kind of, yeah, layer masking and curve and layer adjustments. I like layer adjustments because you know, they're not permanent and you can keep tweaking them. I can go back to the old files and pull up the layer adjustment and I'll like, oh, this was like way too much. I slid this over way too much. So I'll just bring it back and then it was just like jumping out. So I just took it down a tiny bit. And that's kind of some ways that I like to work with these adjustments. I like to keep it super subtle, but to me, it's the clarity of what I'm trying to say in image, I think this is clearer than, okay. So this, I have just one more thing to say, and then we can open it up to questions. But the last thing I'm gonna say is basically just knowing your camera super well. Um, I mean, I've been shooting on the Canon 5D forever, these are the 6D. And 
you know, so, I mean, obviously I shoot manual and a lot of times when you're on travel, for example, you're, things are shifting so quickly, the lights shift quickly, or you go from a bright spot to a dark spot. And, you know, I'm constantly changing my settings, but because I've also been in Lightroom so much, I know, I'm just aware of, if I shoot something dark, I'm like, oh, I have enough room to, you know, pull this back later. I'm not gonna worry about like this moment that had already passed. Or, oh, this was a little bright, but I need to move on. But I know that I have this particular like two stops or one stop of latitude that I can bring it back down without, you know, destroying, you know, the integrity of the file. So just knowing your camera, how much you can push it, you know, how much you can do in Lightroom and when you're on location, you're moving, it's just really helpful. That way you're not missing stuff or like, you know, getting super frustrated, like, oh, I should have just moved the setting more, or knowing that you have a little bit of room to adjust and how much room you have. You know, obviously, like, if it's super dark, you might need to just change the setting band and get another frame. Um, that's all I have as far as the slideshow. Um, we can keep it, we can open up the conversation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, drop them in. Now, do you still, do you still shoot film at all or a lot or not that much? I haven't in a while. Like I used to really love the Mamiya 67. Like I actually was at an event and won, which I never win anything. And I won a bunch of Kodak medium format film. So that's my reason to, you know, start shooting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things where, like, I love shooting film, but I, you know, the gear that I use, it's like, it's, I tell people all the time, we get into like arguments over it, where it's like, I'm shooting the digital version of film. It's like, I feel like I'm shooting film still. Um, you know, I shoot with Fuji Film, whose color technology is amazing. And it's like a lot of the cameras that I'm using, I, I still feel like I'm shooting with my old 35 millimeters. But there is something like, yeah, it's like, I, I'm like you, I, even with my digital work, I like the aesthetic of film. So I was like, I didn't know if it was something that you still mixed in. I know when you're doing commercial work, it's just price-wise and time-wise, it's a hell of a lot easier to just shoot digital and still get that same yeah. aesthetic. Yeah, and for me, like also a lot of my outtakes, I either like, you know, license out or, you know, put on stock and digital is so much more streamlined for that. And I'm able to just shoot a lot and do a lot more with that. Definitely. Now you did touch on like the, you know, like presets and adjusting presets and the VSCO stuff. Now, do you look at, you know, some people you look at their, their body of work and it's almost like it was just done in one color grading session. Like it's just, they have one look that they go for. Now you work, you know, you do editorial work, you do various types of commercial travel, leisure type of stuff. And then on top of your personal work. So is there various, like, is there for like, all right, travel and leisure is kind of this kind of look where it's a little more natural and this over here is, I can go a little more filtered. Is there like a mindset that you have when approaching different, the different types of work that you do? Um, I'd say with the commercial work, I actually don't really put any sets on it. Um, it more comes down to like, and that's also because when you're on set, you're really, you have the time and like the, you know, obviously the gear to really dial in the lighting exactly, you know, as the brief or like how you propose it or however. So when you're doing that sort of thing, I think you're capturing so much of that in camera and like, then it becomes more about like clean up and retouching than like, so like pre um, or with editorial, I feel like it's, you know, it's a lot more loose and like I said, you're shooting like from morning to night and there's all these different like, and there's this cloudy and this and that. So then I kind of try to, bring it all in with a little bit more color um, in the editing to feel like it's going to be that story. And do you have any tips for people for standing out um, to clients and editors or maybe creative directors? Sending out. So putting like, your work, you know, kind of, you, you're, you're like we said, the market's saturated. Um, you know, is there a way that you kind of put yourself out there that sets you apart from the competition? I think you have to do it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it one of those yeah, things was, where, who you know? I mean, is it, is, is the industry I still? You have to do it a lot. Like, I mean, I've sent out so many, <laughs> so many like 
you know, I've tried all sorts of things. I've done PDFs, I've done attachments, I've done links, and like, um, but trying, I mean, like, you know, like I was saying earlier, when you do like the little sequencing thing, if you come out with like a thing you really like, like throw it on a PDF and like send that, you know, um, put it on postcards, send it, or put it like a little Insta story. Um, but I think, I think mean, you just have to do it a lot. And it's, I don't want to say it's an immersive thing, but you just have to do it a lot. And you don't know what's going to hit at the right time. It's half, you know, half the time. I don't think anyone right most people back. And sometimes they do. So it's just being consistent and persistent. We had a, a piggyback question on that. And the, the piggyback was um, in regards to people who are starting out. Um, any advice for people who are just breaking into that for breaking, you know, for who to talk to, what avenues to explore, um, you know, like where do you, where do you, you know, for, if somebody wants to do the, the similar type of work that you're doing, how do you get started? How do you get into the right circles? I think, um, so I guess a couple of years ago when I, um, when I was like deciding like, okay, I want to send some stuff out, I kind of made a list of. These are my target, you know, dream clients. And then I like researched the hell out of all of them. Like, who's the photo editor? Like, where's their office? You know, what, what other, who else are they hiring? Um, and I just had like a, I wasn't trying to, I think I wasn't trying to reach like 10,000 people. I was trying to reach like 20 people. And I think if you narrow it down that way, then you can really focus in and be persistent to those 20 people versus trying to like talk to everybody, which obviously is really overwhelming, then like you're not as great as following up. And sometimes you'll talk to somebody for a long time before they hire you. They just want to get to know you before they send you on something. Or sometimes it happens right away, like it just doesn't, you know, it's hard to tell. You just have to keep doing it. Um, but I do get a lot of these sort of questions and I, um, and then like kind of thinking about putting together like a whole more marketing centric workshop where you know you're talking about, like emails and print promos and portfolio reviews and um, source books and all of the different ways that basically marketers are coming at you. So you can email me about that. Awesome. And so Alan, I, I agree. Alan says you have great work. Definitely agree. Now you notice that with your work, um, there's a lot of strong highlights. And I think you have so many people out there, it's like, well, you know, we shoot in raw now because of the capacity to pull back highlights, and pull back shadows. Um, so where, once in a where you draw the line and saying, you know what, I'm not worried about that sky. This is the aesthetic I'm going for, I'll push the highlights. Is there a line you draw or is there other factors that play into how you decide, you know, as far as blown highlights in a, so this picture, this image that's up right now, it's like it, it fits. You're not worried about the, the depth of color in the sky. It's the aesthetic that you, you have and it's a beautiful shot. You would have people who would try to pull back every single highlight in the clouds and it wouldn't deliver the same effect. So is there a mindset that you have going into that? Ironically, I do pull back a lot of the highlights, but I guess maybe because they start off even more strong. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't use an ND filter. Um, which maybe that's also, you know, part of the, what it is. I just, I just don't. Um, I just like things kind of straight from the lens personally. And a lot of times, yeah, but on the camera, it is pretty blown out. And this is me pulling it back in my room. So I just like, I feel like when you're, I like to evoke like what your eye sees. If you're standing there and you're looking at, you know, standing in stock and you're looking at the building in, you know, kind of late morning or actually the mood is like mid-afternoon, mid-afternoon, the sky is not going to be super blue. It's just your eyes are not going to see that. So I just want to, you know, evoke what I think your eyes want to see naturally and how you would see it if you were there. So that's kind of how I think about it. But I did pull back that sky, I think, in Lightroom for sure. Yes, so everyone. More. No, yeah. that's great. I, every, look, everyone who's listening, I 1,000% agree with that. I would like, I like to see people who, you know, and I would love to see more of the capture what's there and show what's there and take people to that moment. You know, it's like we've become 
in some ways a, a culture of photographers who it's like we have the capabilities so I can go out and take a shot at midnight and make it look like broad daylight well that's great but as soon as you need to if that's like what you have to do it's like I I love you know I love how your work it, it does that it's like it doesn't it takes me right to the moment it makes me feel like I'm in that moment it's not trying to you know not everything needs to be evenly evenly balanced evenly exposed you know I look up at the sky right now and it's like yeah the sky is pretty white right now it's not a blue sky so why am I going to show a blue sky if that's not what's there so it's a refreshing outlook you know for, for someone who, who likes to capture that aesthetic and, and show it um, interesting question here for those people who are drawn to various styles and various aesthetics so you have some people it's like their work is black and white all they do is black and white they do it well um so our, our viewer who's asking the question i'm the same way as you viewer tony i'm the same way there's certain things i like i love color and i love black and white and sometimes you want something that's a little more to use the term light and airy sometimes you want something a little dark and moody how do you narrow down a style so you talked about cross genre still reflecting you does that go cross style you know so it's like if you know if you see something or you want to deliver something that's light and airy how do you do it in your style versus something that's moody but still in your style does that make sense yeah i think that style is like such a kind of deceiving word because it still implies like there's like one look to everything um I think there's a way to do it, like, style that feels like you, where there's certain images, like, you know, if I'm shooting, like, a super shadowy, it's going to be more moody, and this one to me feels a little more airy. But it's not airy in the sense where I think some Instagram, like, feeds are, like, really airy, they're, where their shadows are bright, and, you know, everything kind of is very um, in that super light sense, where I like to keep some of the shadows, um, like, I mean, we can use this image here as an example, like kind of right on the bottom, you know, that bottom of the balcony, like that shadow is dark. Like I could pull it up, but I just like it. Um, this right here is, you know, it's dark. And if I really wanted to go airy, I would just brighten all, like, you know, brighten everything and make it a little more like monotone. But I personally like the shadows. To me, the shadows feel a little more like me, or I'm still keeping obviously the bright sky and the bright, you know, landscape um out so i guess the answer is if you shoot a lot you'll find the common ground between you know black and white and airy and it still feels like your body of work because i don't think the point is to get to a place i don't think the point is to make everything look the same because you want to obviously be flexible but it still reflects like you Exactly. I, I swear it's not we're not asking one giant trick question. It's like we're trying to catch you. <laughs> no, no, it's cool. I mean I actually haven't thought about a lot of these things, so it's interesting. But yeah, for me I like keeping the shadows. <laughs> no, I, I love it. I mean and, and it's like you said, it provides that sense of depth. You know, you there's obviously little depth in the sky and like you know, we're looking at this shot right here and we keep we keep going back to it. So it's like to use the shot for an example. Obviously you don't have the depth in the sky, but you have the depth down below and that's how it was and I think it's really just about keeping it natural and that's what works for your images is that they're so natural and so it just so looks like the moment and it's not over inflated it's not overly lit overly processed you just really let what is there shine and we had one of our comments yeah. saying you know that photography is photographs it's not photoshopping talking about you know, you know your work your work is your work is the art. You're showing the scene as it as it was. Thank you. But yeah, I mean, obviously, I do do a little photoshopping here and there. But it's yeah to clarify the scene more yeah. than to like manipulate it. It's the difference between um, to use a word from Scott Robert Lynn, massaging the photo in post yeah. in post processing. Sure. You're not really you're not going in there with a paintbrush and your palette and just completely taking over the image. You're just enhancing or providing more of an aesthetic um, pop to your image. Yeah, and it's just all like, you know, it just takes a lot of like time and doing and you slowly kind of move towards something or you move away from something and the more you kind of do it, the more you try to figure out like what you like and what works and all of that. 
Yeah. So David says your photos are soft, gentle. I agree. It's like you just have like this really calming, soothing, makes me want to be there kind of aesthetic. So thank you. No, she's paying me for all these comments. That, no. So I, I told her, I, I told her when we first spoke, I looked at I looked at her work and it would, you know, just to give you guys a little backstory about why we're here right now. It's like I looked at, at Natasha's work and I'm like, yes, that's it. Like you have that body of work that people look at and they're like, I want to know how to do that. Like my, you know, like I said, my work's all over the place. So I don't hearing think so, but Ah, uh, I, I look at it and it's like here, it's one day, you know, one day it's here, one day it's over there. And I look at your work and I think it's, it's funny that a lot of the questions that are coming in are stuff that in my head, I'm like, wow, I thought that same thing when I looked at her work, like you can show various scenes, but it still looks like your work, you know, various, you, you go indoors, it could be an indoor dark, you know, dark restaurant in the, during the day, but it looks like Natasha's work. And then you go outside and it could be like a, a vineyard, but it still looks like Natasha's work. So it's like you've successfully transcended through various settings and setups and styles. There's that word again. Um, <laughs> but it all, it all looks like one body of work. Thank you. That is like a super high compliment because that's something I'm like, I've been really conscious of and just working towards and still, am. you know, obviously the journey is like going to keep going. Yeah, so I mean, I think as everyone just to to kind of sum up what we talked about here is find what works for you, find what you like. You're very big on, you know, mood boarding and, you know, really honing in on yeah. what your what you what appeal you want to give or what you're trying to show and practice, 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 practice. There's really no shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sorry. There's no there's no overnight success. Sorry. No <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. There's no and you know what just a side note, I think it's so refreshing what you said about, you know, the whole thing with the presets and using it as a jumping off point for people. And because a lot of people it is it's a great way to put them in the ballpark of where they want to be with their yeah. work. Yeah. Ballpark. You know, for people who don't know how to edit via different color channels and all the other stuff you were talking about, these individual adjustments, a preset will put you in the ballpark, but it's not one size fits all. And I think that's so great that you pointed that out and for people to realize that, hey, you can take a preset and dial down this or still adjust your, your manual settings. Yeah. Now, that being said, um, we did have a question just come in. What? presets sure. and we'll wrap it up here but uh what presets are you currently using that's the one i mentioned um the vsco um portra but like i said i think they pivoted to only mobile but there's so many film emulating presets out there that you can have like so many options Kodak, if I'm you're sure listening, Derek knows more options than I do. <laughs> no, no, you know what? It's it's funny you say that. I'm so old school. I'm a dinosaur. Okay, I think I know I could try I, I edit in um in camera raw still. I go bridge the camera raw. So oh. I know I'm learning capture. That's like one, one by one. That's the uh, I know. I do it each <laughs> one of my image. Well, it's like you said. There's no, and that's why I don't do. I mean, all the Lightroom people are going to convince me otherwise. But every image I take as a single blank canvas. So it's, you know. Also, the other thing I will say about Lightroom, I think as far as like consistency, like, you know, you go to the kind of thumbnail view and when you kind of look at the whole story, like you do a, you know, collection of selects and you look at the whole story and then like try to see if, you know, there's something jumping out within the whole like thumbnail and they all kind of vibe and, you know, it's cool, but and you can see, oh, the sky's really jumping out here, maybe I should bring it down or, you know, in the, like, very, like, if there's, you see, like, nine thumbnails or whatever, or, you know, if there's, like, a red that's, like, really strong, maybe you bring that down, but you kind of look at it as a whole thing, and that's how you kind of start, you know, like, you said, massaging the image to feel, like, in, like, a body of, like, a story that feels consistent. Um, so, yeah, I lost it. <laughs> no, you're good. That's, that's a, a perfect way to wrap this all up. So, a ton of insight. Um, again, I can't say it enough beautiful work. Um, and like, like the comments, all, every comment that comes in is, makes a comment in addition to the question, in addition to the question, it's uh, talking about how 
beautiful your work is. So huge compliment. Um, thank you, thank Natasha. You. We can't thank you thank enough you for having, for having me. Thanks for listening, everybody. No, definitely. We'll have um, to have you back um, in the future. So next time um, we're going to have to maybe we're going to be talking about the Natasha Lee preset pack next time we, we bring her on <laughs> coming, coming this fall. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you again. Thank you for everybody right. for tuning in. Um, from Natasha Lee, I'm Derek Fosner with the BH Virtual Event Space, and we will catch you guys next time.